This next song reminds me of Isaiah 26, 4. It says, trust in the Lord forever, for in God we have an everlasting rock. It also reminds me of my granny, who when she cleaned her house every day, would sing this song over and over again. So, and she was very instrumental in me coming to know the Lord. And I know this song in my heart because of her. Rock of ages, clear for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Rock of ages, oh, clear for me. And let me hide. Myself in Let the water in the blood from thy wounded side which flow be of sin, be of sin, the double cure. Save me from, oh, and make me pure. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Nothing in. Nothing in. Oh, these hands I bring simply to oh, the cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Fall I to fountain fly wash me savior or I you guys <laughs> I didn't mean it Ray uh, <laughs> that's uh, that's one of those old school songs and that's good you know uh, we've we've tended to run away from from the great old hymns I mean that's one of the things that you notice if you'll if you're visiting other churches, uh, they, they do a lot of contemporary music, and some of the contemporary music is fabulous. There's, there's some of it that I just dearly love. I listen to it and think, man, that's great. 
but it just doesn't have the same theological truths that you see in some of these old songs. That song was written in 1763. The guy's name was Augustus Top Lady. That's a bad name, isn't it? Uh, he was a he was a pastor of sorts, and uh, and he was on his his friend's property, and a storm came up, and he figured he was going to perish from the storm, and so what he did is he found a cave, and he dug himself into the cave, and he placed himself in the cleft of two giant rocks, and that's what saved him from the storm, and so as he was there being protected by those clefts, those rocks in that cave, he wrote Rock of Ages. And it's a great old song. It talks about getting the double blessing. You know what the double blessing is? According to, according to uh, Spurgeon, the double blessing is, first of all, justification. We are justified because of Jesus. We are justified because of his death on the cross. And the second blessing is then we're given the opportunity to sanctify. So you're justified, which means if you accept Jesus as your Savior, when you go to heaven, you're justified before God because he had paid for your sins. And then sanctification is something that we get to work out in this life so that we look more and more like Jesus to our world. That's pretty cool. That's the double blessing. So I'm, I'm having more trouble with the second part of the blessing than the first. So are you. Uh, you know, because Jesus did the other one, and this other one, we get to do. Have you ever noticed that, uh, that Jesus is good at the Texas two-step? God is very good at the Texas two-step. He, uh, he always does his part, and then he lets us do our part. For God so loved the world that he gave his part, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Our part. God wants us to come dance. So I'm doing a series of stories of grace from the Old Testament. Now, again, like an old song, sometimes we just run away from the Old Testament and we don't tell the stories. And so it's been fun to, to pull these stories out and begin to tell them again. Many of you might have uh, had, had Sunday school when you were a child and you had these stories expressed to you. As a matter of fact, uh, that's one of the things that I wished I would have had as a child that I did not. We, we didn't uh, attend church anywhere. Matter of fact, people ask me, were your parents, were your parents believers? And I say, well, yeah, but, uh, but we, uh, we were pedestrians. We didn't go anywhere. And, uh, and so uh, I missed hearing stories as a little kid. I heard a few, and the ones I heard I was just enamored with. And a lot of times we forget these stories. They just kind of disappear on us because nobody's talking about them. This one today is about a sensible and beautiful woman who prevents a murder. Yeah, isn't, that, isn't that intriguing? I want that to be intriguing, so I'll wait till it's intriguing for you. <laughs> isn't that intriguing? Yeah, there you go. Thank you. We can continue. Uh, so I want to I talk to you about uh, what's going on in this story because it's a wonderful story of grace and, uh, and, and one maybe you hadn't heard quite this way. Now, let me give you the situation, the background. If you're going to understand a story, you've got to know the background. So I'm going to give you the background. Uh, David is on the run. He's running. He's been running for 12 years. And you might say, well, what's he running from? He's running from King Saul. He was there with Saul, and Jonathan was like a brother to him, and, and Saul like a father, and yet Saul becomes jealous because David has uh, become this wonderful warrior, and he is slotted to be the next king, and, da and, and Saul gets so angry at him, and the truth is, when you read the, the Old Testament and you begin to analyze the personality of Saul, if he was alive today, he would be diagnosed as bipolar, for real massive ups and downs in this guy's life and and when he when he's up he's happy he's contented when he's down he's jealous he's mean he's angry and he kept doing that and he and uh, you know dinner one night he throws a spear at David David decides I'm leaving and David begins to run and for 12 years he's been on the run 12 long years the second thing that's going on is David is living in caves, and he's gathered to himself 600 guys. Now, these aren't, uh, these aren't wonderful people from the neighborhood. 
These are 600 misfits that he's found along the way. Six misplaced people in their society. 600 misplaced people in their society. People with nowhere else to go. Have you ever seen Robin Hood and his merry men? This is it. David. David and his merry men. I mean, they are hiding and running, and, and that's, that's where they are, and that's the process they're in. So he's not only living in a cave and running, he's living in a cave with 600 guys. That doesn't sound good to me. That doesn't sound pleasant at all. And, and he's, he's distressed, and, he, and he's hurting. The next thing we, we know about David in this situation is David and his men are providing a security service. They have to figure out a way to eat. And so what they figure out, David, being an old shepherd, figures out that shepherds need protection. And so they're in an area right now, and this area is called Carmel. And in Carmel, there would be these rich ranchers, and they would have thousands of sheep and thousands of goats, and, and, and they would be out in the wilderness, and then they would bring them all in and shear them. Well, while they'd be out in the wilderness, all these other bandits would come along and steal their sheep and then kill the shepherds and do all that sort of stuff. So David comes up with this great idea. We've got to eat. I, I, I'm training these 600 guys to, to be fruitful and to be great, and they will become great. Matter of fact, some of them will end up on his cabinet when he becomes king. Some of them will be a part of his fighting men. He will, in his last days, talk about some of these are the greatest warriors that he ever stood with. And so what they would do is they would go out and they would create a wall. And that way nobody would come down and steal the sheep or murder the shepherds. And they would go through that whole season untouched. And then after they had gone through the whole season, then they would go and visit the, the landowner's house, the, the rich rancher's house, and, and his men, all of his shepherds would say, they served as a giant wall for us, they cared for us. And there were several times when we would have died and your, and your sheep would have been taken, but these men stood there like a wall day and night, and they protected us. And all they asked for is a tip. They didn't have a set amount. They would just come to the guy during the shearing celebration, and they'd say, give us whatever you think. Give us a tip for our service. Like you, you, tip, a wait, you tip a waiter at the end of a meal. And I hope you do. You know... How many of you ever waited tables? Okay, the hourly wage is awful. You make your money on the tips. So, you know, you want to you wanna tip big, especially if you pray before your meal. You want to be a big tipper. You want to stay on the top side. I had a buddy of mine who was in New York, and he left a tip, and, uh, and the waiter chased him down. And the waiter was going, hey, you call this a tip? I don't need it that bad. Take it. And I said, oh, yeah, you got a tip in New York. They'll come right after you. And so, so David, that's all he's asking for is a tip, and that's all they're working for. So David is living on the ragged edge. He's a king, and he's running a security unit protecting sheep and shepherds. And, and he's, he's, his, his soul is empty. He just wore out. If you can imagine uh, being, being raised in a kingdom and being, being lauded as the, the greatest warrior ever after killing Goliath and all of the things that happened to him and how much praise and all that he had. Now he's in a, he's in a stinky old cave with 600 guys. So let's look at the main characters. There, there are three main characters in this story. The first one's name is Nabal. Nabal is the rich owner of the ranch. Nabal has at least 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. He's wealthy beyond imagination. He's rich, he's selfish, he's unfair, he's greedy, he's deceitful, he's dishonest, and he's a fool. Well, that's a, that's a good inventory of this guy's life. Matter of fact, in the Hebrew, uh, old Hebrew uh, uh, theologians say that he was heavy. And when they say heavy in Hebrew, they meant that he was heavy, heavy rich. And heavy in his ego. And he was harsh. He was stubborn. Uh, today we would classify him as a dysfunctional narcissist. Just a, a massive, massive jerk. And his name actually means fool. 
And he lives up to it. He lives up to the name fool. You ever heard about the little dog that got lost? Had put up a lost and found, looking for our lost dog. He's uh, got three legs, left ears gone, recently castrated, answers to Lucky. <laughs> that name doesn't fit that dog. Nabel, Nabel's name fit him like a T. It's exactly who he is. He's this vile, mean, unbelievable man. His name fits him. He thinks he's a god, and he behaves as though he's a god. Now, second person in, in our story, is her name is Abigail. And Abigail, in Scripture, it says she's sensible, beautiful, smart, courageous, and discerning. She's a doll. Matter of fact, commentators put her as one of the five most beautiful women in the Bible, one of the five most intelligent women in the Bible. One of the five most courageous, courageous women in the Bible. And you barely know who Abigail is. And she was amazing. She was incredible. And now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, how did this incredible woman marry this idiot? Right? You ever think that? You ever, you ever meet people and look at them and, and you go, hmm, who put that thing together? You know, either the guy's just the friendliest, nicest, most wonderful person, and the wife is this woo, horrible, whacked out, crazy lady. Or the, the wife is this sweet, beautiful, wonderful, demure, and, and she's married to an idiot who just is a loud mouth and everybody wants out of the room. That's unfortunate when they pick bad. I get them in my office all the time. We need help. And I'm thinking, sister, you really do need help. You know, <laughs> I remember I uh, had one couple and, you know, they were arguing and fussing. And, and I said, problem is somebody in this relationship needs to die. And, and she said, I think that's a great idea. How are we going to kill him? <laughs> what happened here, though, was it was arranged. So Abigail's parents made a horrible choice. They probably picked Nabal because he was wealthy. Probably pick Nabal because if they get Abigail in there, they're set for life. They just, they're on easy street from here on out. And so here's Abigail, this wonderful, beautiful, in incredible, courageous woman. And then, of course, our last character is the, the king elect, David. David, who, who will one day be king. He's on his way to the throne. Now, when you think about characters, you've got to think about the plot. Now, the plot has husband and wife conflict. And we will see it in the text. You will see it immediately. We have employee, employer conflict. Not only is Nabal a, a jerk to, uh, to, to Abigail, he's a jerk to everybody. His employees hate him. And you would too if you were employed by him. And the final thing in the plot, we have the making of a murder. And so we... we in, uh, and so we have a different in, in, in every way this husband and wife. So they're going to have conflict. Everything about them is different. But she's a realist. She knows, she knows that he's, he's not right. And knowing that, she just does her part to do the best to take care of the employees. And, of course, David, if he's not going to get paid, he has nobody he can go ask. So that's our story. That's the characters, and that's the plot. Let me get to the story. Beginning in, in 1 Samuel, in chapter 25, verses 5 through 7, our story begins. The he in this is David. He sent ten of his young men to Carmel with a message for Nabal. Peace and prosperity to you and your family and everyone you own. I am told that it is sheep shearing time, and while the sheep strayed, um, uh, stayed among us in, uh, near Carmel, we never harmed them, and nothing was ever stolen. Uh, they go on, they say, ask, ask, our, ask your own men, and they will tell you this is true. 
So would you be kind to us, since we have come at a time of celebration, please share any provision that you might have on, on hand uh, with us and with your friend David. David's young men gave this message to Nabal uh, in David's name, and then they waited for a reply. Now let me tell you who these 10 men are. David sends 10 guys. These 10 guys are guys that are diplomatic. He is training because he knows he's going to be king one day. And so he's got all these misfit guys coming to him, and, and many of them are ready to just take a sword and go to town. They're, you know, they're big, strong. They're going to make the team, right? I mean, when you have tryouts in high school for football, the guys come out, you can almost look at them and tell which ones are going to do well and which ones are going to be on the, you know, the, the water bucket team. You know, the guys that are going to be the trainers and take other jobs because they're just not built for it. Well, these 10 guys are diplomatic. These are people that he's found in his 600. These are wise young men. Maybe they're musicians, some of them, because David loved music. But the idea is they probably weren't fit to be his warrior, but they were very much fit to be a diplomat. Maybe they had some education, and David then would sit them down, and he would talk to them, and he would say, when you're among the kings, this is the way you act, this is the way you behave, here's how you do things. And so they come to Nabal, and they are complete gentlemen. They stand before Nabal, and they say, we come from our master David. We have protected your flock all this time, and, uh, and so we're here to collect a tip or any kind of gift you'd like to give. Notice there's no percentage they're not asking for a tenth or fifteen or anything. They're, they're just saying whatever you feel led to give. And we did a good job. Ask your, ask your employers. They will tell you. Ask your employees. They'll tell you they were taken care of. And then they stood back and they waited. Put their hands behind their back and they waited for uh, Nabal to, to do whatever Nabal was going to do. And so very cordial, very businesslike, very kingly-like. They were going to they, they take care of this situation that they had. And there they wait, and, uh, and look what happens next. Now, uh, you know, there's some question about Nabal being an idiot, and so he will begin to talk and take all question out of it. Everybody will know he's a complete fool. Uh, it says, who is this fellow David? Nabal sneered to the young men. And who does this son of Jesse think that he is? There are lots of servants these days that run away from their masters. See, he knows who David is. He knows he's the son of Jesse. He knows he's the, the future king. And he's saying, this guy is an outlaw. He's run away. He's run away from the king Saul. So he, he goes on and he says, uh, he says uh, um, should I take my, my bread and my water and my meat that I have slaughtered for my, uh, for, my, for my shears and give it to a band of outlaws who, who, come, who come from who knows where. So he's telling them to butt a stump. He's telling them to go away. I'm, and I'm not paying David nothing. You ever meet anybody unreasonable like that? Maybe you had a boss that was unreasonable like that? Maybe you, you've been around, all of us know somebody like this, don't we? Uh, the, these people exist all over our world. Uh, and, you know, he's, he's, he's somebody you just, you can't talk to him. So, uh, the ten guys. So, so David's young men returned and told him what Nabal had said. And this is where David now gets a little crazy. It says, get your swords, was David's reply as he strapped on his own. And then 400 of them started off with David and 200 remained behind to guard their equipment. So David, as soon as he gets the answer, not the answer he wanted, he straps his sword on, he's angry. Now, I wanna explain some things about David. David is on a short fuse. Been running for 12 years. It's unfair the way he's been treated. Things about how he's been treated are just horrible. And, and he's, he's, at, he's at his end. He's, he's, about to, he's about to just pop. Have you ever been there? 
where you're outside your personality and then, you know, normally you're, you're calm, your demeanor is okay, and you're not going to blow, but then all of a sudden things just mount up and they mount up and they mount up, and then you just kind of explode, and when you do, you become insane. Anybody remember green stamps? Remember those? I used to get them in my Christmas stocking. <laughs> so. That's how cheap my parents were. Uh, but I, I remember, I, I remember there, was a, there was a catcher's mitt I wanted, and the only place I could find it was, was at the green stamp store. And, and I, I started filling up my old book. My grandma gave me a book, and I was filling that thing up with green stamps and licking them, and boy, they were nasty, and sticking them in. And, you know, and when you start, the book is thin, and when you get done, it's a big old fat thing. You know? And then you go in, and you get to cash it in, right? And if you've got enough stamps in there, they will cash it in, and they will tell you, okay, you can have anything on that shelf, right? But you can't do anything till you, can, till you get them all there. You can't cash them in. And I was going to get that ball glove, and I remember when I cashed it in. Well, here's what's happening emotionally. This happens to us in relationships, too. Emotionally, we don't get green stamps, but we get stamps. We're somewhere, and... I'll say something stupid, right? I know that's, un- you, you, you're going, you? No, uh, and, 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 it, and it's, not, it's not nice toward Donna, okay? But she doesn't do anything. But it's like a little stamp that goes in the book, <laughs> right? And then, unusual for me again, I say something stupid again or embarrassed or something, wait, and that little stamp goes in the book, Right? Until guess what? I do something not nearly as stupid as the ten things that I've done before, but she's ready to redeem the book. <laughs> right? And she's ready to cash that sucker in, and here it comes. So, I, you know, I should, have been, I should have been told something along the way, but I wasn't given any clues. And then all of a sudden, here it comes. Kaboom. And when it comes, you know, If a little squirrel gun will take care of it, you know, she's going to get out of cannon. Just blow it up. That's where David is. He's ready to redeem his stamps. He is irritated. He's living in a cave with a bunch of dirty old guys, right? He's, he's He's not having the kind of food he wants to have. I mean, he sent his 10 guys off, and he started the barbecue because he's waiting on some. He's going to throw some lamb chops on there. He can't wait till the food gets there, and he's not getting the food he wants. You do that to a man for very long, and bad things will happen. He's just not, nothing is going the guy's way. He's out here having to have a security guard system to, so he can survive, and he's supposed to be the king. And he hadn't killed anybody in a long time. He's antsy. He hadn't been to battle, right? And so he takes off. And the, the, the interpretation of this verse is, he says, mount up. We're going to go kill that guy. And, I mean, they head out. And in his heart, they, they're going to have, they're gonna have skewered nabal, buns and all. <laughs> they're not going to get sheep, they're going to get nabal. And he, when he takes off, he talks about, we're going to get there, I'm going to kill everything in sight. We're going to ride down here, and we're, we're going to murder all of his servants. We're, we're, I mean, we're going to take it to the ground. And he's that angry, and he takes off. Uh, by the way, I want to I want to just show you something uh, about anger. There are four major characteristics around anger, and sometimes we don't realize how all of a sudden we're angry. Does that happen to you? You know, you're not an angry person, and all of a sudden you realize I am like filled with anger. I don't I don't understand why. There are four major contributors to anger: fear, hurt frustration, and injustice. When you get really super fearful about something, you'll get angry. It just comes. It's a part of the emotion. If I hear a bump in the night, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm fearful, and, but I got to go check it out, I'm going to take something for when I get angry. You know, I'm going to take a ball bat or a gun or something because I'm fearful, and anger comes, or I'm hurt. When you get hurt, somebody hurts you, somebody, somebody does you wrong, somebody takes something that's yours, somebody 
destroys your heart, your soul, somebody does that to you, you're going to get angry. You should get angry. When, when, when you get frustrated. Boy, you ever get, I remember we had a back door. And, and I'd always come in the back door when I was a kid, and the back door made this silly little noise when you opened it up, a little screen door, you know, made this, this noise. And I, I don't remember what happened that night, but I was just frustrated. And I was, you know, just trying to sneak in, and I, I grabbed that door, and it made that funny noise, and I just ripped it off. I just tore it off, and I thought, how did I have strength to do that? And why did I do that? Utter frustration. And then injustice. When something that's not supposed to happen against you happens against you, and there's not a thing you can do about it. You get, a, you get accused wrongly. Uh, you know, it, bad things happen to you. Now look at that list. David is filled with that list. Throughout Samuel, you'll read, And Saul, with 6,000 men, comes out to the wilderness to find David. Saul, with 3,000 men, is coming out to the wilderness to find David, to kill him. So he's fearful. He's, he's, he's having to move all the time. He's having to stay in front of wherever Saul is. He has to know where he is 24-7. He's fearful. And he's hurt. He was like a son to Saul. Uh, Saul he, he married Saul's, Saul's daughter. And Saul has taken his wife and given her off to somebody else. Jonathan was his best friend. He was his life. He's hurt. And he's frustrated. It's frustrating living in a cave. You don't believe that? Ask those little soccer team. It's frustrating being in a cave. You ever go down, as you're headed down to San Antonio and they have all those caves you can visit? Don't. <laughs> stalagmites or stalactites or mosquito bites, whatever those things are that are hanging down, you go in and looking around. All it does is tell you that Texas is about ready to crash because they show you this vault. And, you know, I mean, you're like, Gah. and And my son Chad loved those things. And you put me in a cave and claustrophobic hits right now. And it's frustrating being in there. You're nervous the whole time. Well, he's living in a cave. You know, I mean, just think of the smells in the cave just had to be gross. And then the injustice. The injustice of being the future king and having to be on the run. He's not having a good time. And so he's not thinking right. And so he's got his boys on. I mean, they're, they're headed to Carmel. They are going to take Nabal, and Nabal, and he, he ain't no longer going to be. And so that as, it, as that happens, it says, Meanwhile, one of Nabal's servants went to Abigail and told her, yeah, see, this is a pattern. Anytime they couldn't get through to Nabal, they would go to Abigail. They knew Abigail was smart and reasonable and wonderful, and they knew Nabal was a jerk. He was never going to do anything the way they wanted him to do it. And so it said, it said, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, but he, but he screamed insults at them. And, of course, this does not surprise her. She, she understands that. And these men, have, uh, these men have been very good to us, and, and we're never, we never suffered any harm from them. And nothing was stolen from us uh, the, the whole time that they were with us. And they go on, and it says, uh, it says you need to know that, that uh, you need to know this and figure out what to do. For there is going to be trouble for our master and for his whole family. He's, he is so ill-tempered that no one can ever talk to him. Okay, these guys are panicked. They saw it happen. They saw the ten young men wait for a reasonable answer. And they heard Nabal swear, scream, carry on, say bad things about David. And they didn't respond to him at all. They just simply nodded and they left. Now what these guys know is they went back, they're reporting that to David. And they're saying, we're toast. Because Nabal is such an idiot. He's such a fool 
that he has, he has put us all in jeopardy. And we just know for certain David is on his way right now to do away with us. Why should we die because he's such an idiot? And so, so what, what she does is she snaps into gear and she starts shooting orders. She said, okay, you start cooking this, you get that together, you get this together, you load that donkey, you load that one, you get this one ready. And she's making up a plan as she goes because she realizes they are all in jeopardy. And if she doesn't take care of it, bad things are going to happen. And so look at what she does. On a, on a minute's notice, she puts together 200 loaves of bread. She puts together two wineskins uh, full of wine. She gets five sheep that have been slaughtered, a bushel of roasted grain, a hundred clusters of grapes, and 200 fig cakes. I mean, she goes into cater. I mean, she turns into Monette. throws it all together, gets it on donkeys, and tells her, tells her servants, get as far down the road as you can. I'm, I'm going to be there. I'll, I'll get there. Get going. And while she finishes everything up, and then she prettys herself up, and she gets on a donkey herself, and she heads down, and she gets to a ravine, and she runs into David and his men. And just before she runs into him, David is still insane. He's still telling, telling his men, he says, this guy is returning evil for good. And if I don't slaughter everybody in his family, may God take my life. I mean, he is still raging. And here comes Abigail. <laughs> you get it? He's raging. He's angry. And all of a sudden, in front of him is a beautiful woman with a crock pot. I mean, David must have stopped and looked around, probably looked at his ten guys, and they went. <laughs> he looked back, and there's this most marvelous speech that she makes. I mean, it is, it is, uh, she falls on the ground and bows before him, and she says, please hear your servant. She says, I know, I know you are the, going to be the king, my master has treated you awful. See, she's a realist. By the way, she doesn't tell Nabal what she's doing. She just takes off. See, if I were her, and they were to tell me what, what was about to happen to everybody in Nabal's family, I would have said, let's all go hide and let David come and kill him. Am I the only one who thought of that? She was smart. I, that had to pass through at some point. Uh, I bet she thought, I'll go put on my prettiest stuff and, and stand back and, and, you know. But no, she's out here saving him because he's her husband. And she's doing what she does because she's the wife. And she's saving the business. She's saving the ranch. She's saving the employees. And she's going to honor David. She gets up and she says, please listen to your servant. She takes full credit for the bad behavior of Nabal. I am so sorry, David, that my master is a jerk. But I know he's a jerk. We all know he's a jerk. He's a complete fool. I know this. And it does you no good to murder a fool. And then she goes on and she explains to David, you are a man of great honor. You are a man of great esteem. You are a wonderful warrior. You took down the giant. You are going to be the most wonderful king Israel has ever seen. You do not want to be a king that is known for murdering uh, an idiot fool of a rancher and his family. That he deserves it, but that would not serve you well. So I would beg that you would put the fault on me and allow me to apologize by giving you what is your due and more and that, would you, that you would leave us in peace. You know, one commentator says that, uh, that Abigail is a cold rag on a hot head. Have you ever been in that, in that position where you're just blowing up, and the soft hand of your wife leans over and puts it on your wrist that's about to do harm. And it just 
makes it all different, doesn't it? I mean, it just makes you kind of pull it all back in and realize, yeah, this is stupid. Usually ha happens to us in the car. You know, that guy's cut me off. And, and, and so, you know, I got, I got five tons of metal. I'll, I'll show him, you know, and I start, you know. And there's usually a hand that comes over. But it doesn't usually land on my wrist. It usually lands on my leg and grips in, you know. Uh, it's a cool hand on a hot head. And we need that. David desperately needed that at that point. None of his advisors were even bothering. You know, <laughs> if you've ever been with a boss that is like, you know, blowing up, screaming, it's not at that point where you say, well, let's sit down and talk about this. Let's discuss what ought to be our course of action. Mm -mm. No, David was mounting them up. And, and I believe the 200 that stayed behind were going, <laughs> whoo, he was mad. And yet Abigail gives this beautiful, wonderful speech to him. Tells him how, how gracious and wonderful he is. And he wants to be a king who doesn't have a conscience that is bad. Doesn't want him to be a killer king. Probably he, he began to think about some of the things and ways that Saul is. And how much like Saul he felt at that moment. And she convinces him to take all that back. She not only convinces him, he looks down at her and he says, thank you. You are amazing. I will accept this gift from you, and I am thanking you that you, you taught me again that vengeance isn't mine. Vengeance belongs in the hands of God. And it's not mine to take vengeance, and I thank you. And he says, no harm will ever come to you or your home. And he sends her back. Now, she goes home. And, of course, when she gets home, uh, Nabal is in a drunken stupor. He's having a party. So he's just drunker than a skunk. He's having, I mean, if I were her, I'd have gone back. And, I, you know, I'd have looked, you jack wagon, I just saved your backside. I just saved everything for us because you're an idiot. You know, do you, don't you, you know people, don't you just feel for some women who after they've been in a social setting, you, you know, they, they stay back and they almost say, you know, I'm sorry. I, I know that was crude to him. That was rude to him. I am so sorry. And all you can say is, I'm so sorry you're married to him. You know, that's awful for you. You know, or, or a husband sometimes has to do that. Please, please forgive us. And you're thinking, us? It was your wife, dude. You know, and it's awful when you have to live like that. Awful. And Abigail comes home, and here's this big, sloppy drunk. She thinks, forget it. She goes to bed. The next morning, when she wakes up, she decides to tell Nabal all that had transpired. And, uh, and she, when the wine had gone out of him, she sat him down and she said, Nabal, let me tell you what yesterday brought. Because you are so foolish and you are so ignorant, you were so rude to those ten people that came down, you were about to be skewered, you were about to die. All, all your employees, everything you owned was going to be gone. And so while she is telling him the story and how she took care of it for him again, and this is a conversation I know they'd had over and over and over again. And while she was saying it to him, his, his heart turned to stone. The guy had a stroke right in front of her. And for 10 days, he lay in a coma. And at the end of 10 days, he was gone. Wow. What a story, right? It doesn't end there. Uh, matter of fact, in, in verse 40, it says, When the messengers arrived at Carmel... They told Abigail, David has sent us uh, to, take, to take you take you back to marry him. So David was absolutely smitten with Abigail. And he saw in her a courageous, wise woman. Somebody who, who's worthy to be among the kingdom. And, and, you know, this is a great story. I mean, when he finds out Nabal's gone, I'm 
I'm going after her. And of course, she prays about it for about a second. She says, let me get my gear together. I'm going to grab my five girls, and we're on our way. And she said, I, listen, I'd come wash the feet of David's warriors rather than be married to Nabal. Are you kidding me? And, which is all Hebrew for, I'm there, he's hot. <laughs> and nice and smart. And so she joins him, and that's where the story ends. You know, she kept him from from something that would have haunted him the rest of his life. As a matter of fact, I think she prevented more than one murder. Because in, in, in 1 Samuel 26, the very next chapter, Saul is, comes out in the wilderness again with 3,000 of his men. And David figures out where he is because he's close by. And David sneaks into his camp with one other warrior. And they stand there over Saul, who is sound asleep. And right next to Saul is a jug of water and a spear. And his warrior whispers to him, David, we got him. It's over. Let me just take this spear, one thrust. He'll never know what hit him. And I'm certain. David looked down and thought, Abigail's right. I don't want to go to the throne with a bad conscience. I don't want to be known as the murdering king. And he says to the man, this is God's anointed. He's king because God has allowed it. And I'm not going to interfere with that. One day he will die in battle or of old age, but not by my hand. Great maturity that he had learned. And he had learned it from Abigail. You ought to go read that story. It's cool. They take the spear and the jug of water. And he goes up on the hill, and, and he, he, he starts yelling down uh, at, to, the, to the camp. <laughs> he yells down to his commander. He says, hey, you're a real good soldier. Here I stand with your king's spear and his jug of water. You're really protecting him well. And then he cries out, and he begs for Saul to tell him, why are you chasing me? Why, why do I am feeling this injustice? but he always had a clean conscience. That's why later it would hurt his heart when he has one of his warriors killed because of sin in his life. One of the things that, uh, that I thought about as I finished this is, uh, first of all, I thought, I can't promise every, every woman that when she operates around the truth, her sorry husband will die. Uh, <laughs> Boy, sometimes you'd like to. <laughs> sometimes you're thinking, oh, maybe you'll get lucky. Uh, but here's what, I, here's, what I, here's what I see in this. I see that wisdom is rewarded with relief from above when you operate in wisdom. When you operate out of, out of your out of your belly, which is the way that Nabal operated. When you operate out of your emotions, that takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of power. It, it takes a lot from you. It hurts your heart. But when you operate with discernment and wisdom, it's as though God enters in and God begins to counsel you and teach you and help you to understand what it is that you should do. What is the appropriate, what would Jesus do thing to do here? You know how many, many men are, and women are locked up in prison because there wasn't an Abigail put a soft hand on an angry arm? There's people in prison that out of jealousy and out of emotion quickly made a decision that has cost them the rest of their lives cost them their reputation, their homes, everything. That's why God wants us to be a, a people that are gentle in spirit, which simply means be discerning, be wise. Let God temper how you think and what you do so that at the end of the day, your conscience is free and you receive the second part of the blessing 
from rock of ages. Your life is sanctified. You're justified in Christ, yet you lived in a sanctified way. And that's what Abigail taught David. So, Father, I pray that's what Abigail has taught us. To not be emotional, reactive in nature, but, Father, just to love you, to follow you, to let you do the vengeance. Some of us, God, you know, we're just hanging on to vengeance. We're so frustrated and angry at somebody in our world. And, and wisdom says, just put the sword down. Just relax. Let, let God take over and let him be the one who affects vengeance. Father, help us that we would have wisdom and discernment like Abigail and that we would find ourselves behaving as a king because we serve a wonderful king. In Jesus' name, amen.